On behalf of my colleagues, I'd like to thank you all for joining us today during these very interesting times. You know, the pandemic has thrusted us into the future, rendering the present as the past and the future is now. Digital literacy is now a uh, passport to success for large corporations and individuals alike. However, we, when we consider some of the you know, inequities that are caused by and, and enhanced by such a shift, it's really important to discuss the digital divide. So I really do look forward today to hearing from my colleagues um, as they discuss some of the intricacies and ways that we can alleviate issues post pandemic. You can go to the next slide. Next slide, Catherine. So just a little bit about myself, my Dr. O, I'm currently the Assistant Chief Academic Officer here supporting Dr. Potter's leadership as our Chief Academic Officer. Um, and my research in my doctoral work was in educational access and opportunities in higher education. One of the reasons I was attracted to the University of the District of Columbia. Um, I use universal design for learning as a framework, you know, as a sort of a proxy to um, use to investigate inclusive teaching practice and approaches um, at a large, uh, you know, predominantly white institution. This was motivated because in, this un in an undergrad situation with me, I was the student that was at a large school, very um, prominent, but I didn't necessarily benefit from the approaches that were um, being used in, in class. So I decided, you know, of course, to dedicate um, my life to understanding the intricacies of this. And what I what I unpacked in, in some of my research is this, as some of you may be aware, what is called the Cambridge model, right? I understood that the structural roots of higher education, um, modern higher education at least, wasn't necessarily meant to ev educate everyone. It was meant to educate the gentleman scholar, right? An elite group of individuals. Since there have been many additions to actually um, extend access to a broader range, but the structural roots still remain the same. Next slide. So I started to understand that access to education and access to learning are two different things, right? Access to education being having being where students have the opportunity to actually be educated in school. They can actually attend college and we're, we're continuing to do some great work in higher ed, extending access to education. But yet access to learning is still at issue. There are students who uh, pay every day to come to school uh, and attend classes or work towards degrees, but never really have a chance because of inequities in the classroom in terms of the approaches that are used that may stimulate, um, tend to, and account for their unique difference. So, um, you, next slide. In this, in this same way, I, I, I think when I think about the digital divide today, I think about capitalism and how it's not necessarily made for everyone to succeed. If we look at the, you know, the pyramid that it is, so the digital divide conversation, you know, challenges us to make bridges to allow for greater access for individuals who may not already have access to digital resources and materials. But just similar for access to education versus access to learning, it is also incumbent upon us to be mindful of digital redlining. Digital redlining um, in, in terms of making sure that the access that is, is allowed is equal and equitable in a way that allows for true uh, digital literacy to happen and for it to be a way that can allow those individuals to thrive. Next slide. So, you know, in closing, I'll say this pre COVID, we existed in a time where some individuals were operating 20 years in the future and in an office right next to that person or right down the street, the house next door, it could have been where other individuals were operating 20 years in the past. The gap has only been widened. It used to be that innovating, you um, were kind of, you know, current, keeping up, um, and now it's a means of survival. In status quo, um, individuals and organizations and groups that operate at the status quo run the risk of being obsolete. So I, I, I salute my colleagues for using this as an opportunity to take the time out and examine how we can, as an institution and as a community, interrupt the cycle of social reproduction that promotes these haves and have nots and, and leaves a lot of those invisible um, aspects as a thousand cuts on our social fabric so that we can envision a more equitable future for our learners and our community. So I'd like to next just introduce my colleague, Dr. Zenendel. He's going to be going a little bit more in detail about the digital divide and introducing our panelists. So, so thank you all and sending positive vibrations to you during these interesting times. Thank you, Carl. Thank you for your great introduction. I really appreciate it. 
So welcome everybody to UDC uh, Imperative Equity Imperative and Social Justice Webinar. I'm Kamran Zendedel, the Acting Director of the Center for Sustainable Development and Resilience in College of Agriculture, Urban Sustainability and Environmental Sciences in UDC. We are very happy to be with you once again and be able to discuss and focus on a topic that was raised during the last webinar. Today we will talk about digital divide in time of COVID-19. Before starting our webinar, a few quick uh, housekeeping notes uh, for all of the participants. Please be sure that you stay muted throughout the event to make it easier for us to hear the speaker. If you have questions for the panelists, we will answer your question at the end of the discussion, something around between 11 to 11.20. You can enter your questions into the chat box, or if you have if you are following us through the Facebook Live, you can enter your, your question to the comment to the comment part. Okay, before introducing our great panelists, let me talk a little bit about the topic and, sh and share some statistics. So, Catherine, if you could share the PowerPoint, that would be great. The necessity of the life include food, water, shelter, and now the internet. We need smartphones, computers, tablet, and technology to carry out our day-to-day -day routines. However, it is essential to know that 25% of DC households lack access to broadband internet service, and 70% of them lack access to a computer. How are they surviving without this technological necessity? Access to digital device, devices is not only relevant today, but vital as we face the COVID-19 pandemic which has changed many aspects of our life, presenting various challenges, as well as some opportunities to reinvent how we do things. At the University of the District of Columbia, we are working closely with all faculty, students, staff, and partners to ensure our task, educating the next generation of leaders is not impacted by, the pand by this pandemic. UDC is a public, historically black land-grant university in the nation's capital serves the needs of the community of the District of Columbia and produces lifelong learners who are transformative leaders in the workforce, government, nonprofit sectors, and beyond. As our academic classes and community outreach programs have moved to online platforms or student and community access to internet and their ability to use technology and adapt to this new environment will dramatically impact their success and progress. This challenge further highlights the digital divide issue in our communities. The digital, the digital divide is defined as the growing gap between those who have access to information and communication technology and those who do not. The evolution of the digital divide has transformed over the years to present itself as a both a technological issue and a social one. Digital divide disadvantaged pocket of people in the district because of their income, education, age, and disability status. For many, the digital divide makes striving for upper mobility a nearly impossible struggle. In this webinar, we would like to focus on bridging the digital divide in time of uncertainty for underserved students and communities in Washington, D.C. We will discuss challenges and describe all responses to ensure we will be able to continue our services. Uh, um, so in this, I would like to start, uh, so as you can see in the next slide, please. Uh, as you can see, as I described that, so we are making progress. And now, as you realize that, you know, still 25% of people in DC do not have access to broadband internet and technology needed to help them to pass through this pandemic. So next slide, please. And with this, I want to introduce you know, our great panelists. So these are the major things that we want to focus. What does the digital divide issue look like post COVID-19? And how can we create an environment conducive to learning in this new normal? Okay, so with this um, introduction, I would like to introduce our great panelists. So I appreciate Catherine if you could share our panelists picture. The first panelist is Dr. Lawrence D. Potter, Jr. 
So he was appointed as UDC Chief Academic Officer in February 2019 after a 20 year career in leadership in higher education administration, including serving as a tenure professor, department chair, associate dean, two time chief diversity officer, and principal investigator, director of McNair Scholars Program. Dr. Potter is an experienced leader, an accomplished educator, and author. He is currently helping lead UDC. UGC academic and research enterprises to the challenges presented by the COVID-19 crisis. His professional experiences at diverse type of U.S. higher education institution have made him a highly sought speaker, consultant, and commentator on matters related to college access, student success and retention initiatives, faculty development and investment, academic budgeting and strategic planning, institutional climate and culture, international education, curricular innovation and program development and growth, as well as fundraising, governance, and external relations. Throughout his career, Dr. Potter has encouraged innovation scholarship and teaching, launched initiatives to build interdisciplinary strength around global challenges, created environments that foster inclusive excellence, and expanded the opportunity for experiential learning. Dr. Potter graduated magna cum laude with a triple major in English, philosophy, and religion from the Stillman College and earned his master's degree and PhD in English with distinction from the University of Missouri, Columbia. A leading scholar of race and literacy studies, he has traveled and lectured extensively in Africa, Asia, and Europe. Our next panelist is Dr. Barbara Means from West Coast, California. She's she is Executive Director of the Learning Sciences Research at Digital Promise, she studies the effectiveness of innovation, innovative education approaches supported by digital technology. With funding from the National Science Foundation and Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, she is currently studying the equity impacts of the shift remote instruction caused by COVID-19 pandemic. Her other ongoing work includes supporting colleges and universities in implementing continuous improvement research on their effort to incorporate learning technologies in ways that they enhance, that enhance, enhances teaching and learning in high enrollment gateway courses. Dr. Means has advised the U.S. Department of Education on national education and technology plans and has authored or edited more than a half a dozen books related to learning and technology. She earned her undergraduate degree in psychology from Stanford University and her PhD in educational psychology from University of California, Berkeley. On our last but not least, Palace is Chavar Henry. Mr. Henry is proud Jamaican, enrolled in UDC engineering department after graduating from prestigious Tickfield High School. He is working toward earning a Bachelor of Science degree in civil engineering in 2022. Currently a sophomore who is no stranger to the Dean's List, Jawar was sworn in as the student representative to UDC's Board of Trustees in May 2020. They currently serve as the public relations agent for the Caribbean Student Association overseeing promotions of the club events. Chavar is committed to the university and community and is working with his talent. Okay, I welcome the, uh, our panelists. So I'm very, very happy to have you uh, to this webinar. Okay, I go directly to my question and uh, the first question that I have is for Dr. Means. Dr. Means, through my introduction, um, so I talk a little bit about the digital divide, but I would like to ask you to help us to understand what is the digital divide and what are the impact of digital divide on our schools and communities in particular in time of COVID-19? If you are speaking, you are muted. Thank you. Catherine, could you put up the slides, please? Thank you. There we go. Um, I just uh, want to thank you again for the opportunity to be part of this panel. I think this is such an important issue and that the digital divide, it's not that it wasn't 
there before, but its urgency is all the more apparent during the current time. We can go to the next slide. I'll just start with uh, some of the data. This is from the Pew Research Center, which keeps some of the most up-to-date uh, data, which helps us look at uh, differences in different income levels, for example, in what is available to homes with school-age children. And this applies equally well to homes of people who are older as they're attending college. And what you can see, high income here is uh, households with $100,000 and more. Low income is less than 30,000. And although there are devices in most households of some kind, look at the difference between who has a laptop or desktop computer. And if you're trying to do something where you're creating with technology or you're actually continuing a course online, that's a really important advantage over someone trying to learn on a smartphone. And you can look at the size of that gap. You also need to continue a course online. You also need broadband internet access. And again, you look at the dramatic gap. So although people will often tell you that, oh, we've closed the digital divide, 98, 99% of school districts have an internet connection, that does not mean that real people in their real homes actually have those. And of course, a disproportionate share of those low income homes without broadband internet or without a laptop or desktop uh, at the home are made up of African American and Latinx uh, students and their parents. So this is where we have 40% of America's public school enrollment. And you can see the size of the gap. The gap is less. Uh, for smartphones, uh, but it's still significant. So we are nowhere near closing that access gap. Uh, in fact, and that turns into, when you actually think about what happens in education, that turns into what they're now calling the homework gap. Um, we see that 24% of low-income teens say they're sometimes unable to complete their homework because of lack of access to a computer or an internet connection. 35% of teens and 45% of low-income uh, teens in low-income homes say they are sometimes or often unable to do or must do their homework on their cell phones because it's the only, uh, the only option. And if you have ever tried to take an online course that includes uh, practice and interactive simulations and so on, on a smartphone, you know that in many cases, the courseware wasn't really designed for that kind of interface, and it's much more difficult to work on it. If we go to the next slide. Um, a Digital Promise, the nonprofit where I work, uh, we talk about the digital divide as being more than this access inequality. And the access inequality is important but in, as this slide tries to show, it's only the tip of the iceberg. There's also a real inequality in the empowering uses of technology that people are exposed to. The uh, context within classrooms and within homes is also really important. And there's a great deal of research on this now. We know that in many classrooms teaching students from low-income homes, they are using technology within the school, but what they're using it for is largely drill and practice and to practice test taking. And this has really uh, come to the fore even more than it was before with the current um, mandated tests that are taken online. And therefore, we have classrooms practicing to do those. If you contrast that, though, with what happens with classrooms serving higher income kids, and the latter, they're much more likely to have students actually doing something with technology tools where they're creating something rather than just practicing taking tests. And they're also more likely to have technology supported long term projects that require students to learn to manage their own time and to assess the quality of their own learning. And when you think about what that means. Uh, in the current time, where students are very much required to manage their own learning, particularly older students and college students, 
you can see that we have a difference in the exposure to the kinds of opportunities that would help people acquire those skills. And that also pertains to what happens in terms of the kind of social capital you have in some homes where um, students or members of the household have other members of the household who are knowledgeable about technology, can teach them about how to use technology to do things, uh, introduce them to new technologies, whereas other households don't. And then finally, we have the lack of participation. Um, everything from applying to jobs to securing health care now is done online. And if you can think about setting up a profile and cultivating a professional network on LinkedIn, for example, the fewer of these digital practices you participate in, the fewer of the benefits you enjoy. And so when we think about the digital divide today, it really has all three of these aspects and permeates our society. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you, Catherine. So, um, as um, uh, you heard reference before, we're currently doing a study funded by the National Science Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, where we're looking at what's happening uh, with college students in the field during the COVID pandemic. And we're doing a survey of a nationally representative sample of 1,000 undergraduates. Uh, it's still ongoing, but I have some uh, early responses to it. I can share you some impressions. And we're also doing case studies of courses in 12 colleges and universities, um, particularly in STEM courses. Um, so I, I think that's an area where we're particularly vulnerable because the courses tend to be sequential and very demanding at the same time. The next slide. So what we're hearing is that uh, many of the campuses had internet and computing facilities that were available to students that helped to bridge some of that digital divide in some ways, it's again is the tip of the iceberg, but those were no longer available for students after the pandemic hit. And the home access to the internet and devices is nowhere near universal as we um, talked about here. Um, when uh, I'm looking at what we have in our survey, uh, about one in six students said after they went home, they had major internet connectivity problems, either often or very often while trying to continue their courses. About 7% of students in four-year colleges and 22% in two-year colleges had to share the computing device were using for the course with other people in their home, an average of two and a half other people. About 3% of four-year students and 5% of two-year students tried to continue uh, their courses using their smartphones because that was all they had. Um, we also heard that finding a quiet place and a time for learning online was particularly hard. Around one in five said they had family responsibilities that were a major challenge juggling with their course. About one in eight said they had job responsibilities that they found were interrupting their ability to work on, on their course. And as I said, this data is still coming in. Once it's complete in the next week or so, we'll be analyzing the nature of these challenges and be able to um, quantify which ones are most prevalent and also for different kinds of students and really explore the equity implications of that. But uh, the other thing we're doing is trying to understand some of the instructional strategies that help under these circumstances. And this is my final slide. The next one, please. Um, what we're learning is that, and this is where I think uh, universities like UDC can really do something. We're learning that the support and experience using technology for learning that both students and instructors had before the pandemic made a big difference for students and instructors. So in some of these universities, they were really emphasizing using digital learning tools and helping their faculty learn how to do that to close equity gaps and improve outcomes for students. Those courses moved online much more seamlessly. But in all cases, you have to consider equity in the face of such disruptions. Um, helping students get needed computing devices and broadband access is really critical. 
Providing asynchronous options, that is, you can do it on your own time for students with unreliable connections or schedule conflicts. Some of the students in our survey were first uh, were frontline workers in the healthcare industry, for example, and trying to continue their coursework at the same time. And so they need to have options to work at uh, different time frames. But you still need to be present for students. Um, we heard over and over again from students that having connection with their instructors, having a sense of that losing that connection made them lose confidence. Um, and losing the connection with their peers uh, to have interactions and to support each other when they have questions about content. And th then finally, um, the way in which learning is assessed and grading occurs is very important to students, of course. And emphasizing evidence of learning over meeting deadlines appears to be really important. That is uh, not giving credit uh, you know, all credit or no credit, depending on whether or not you made the deadline is really important because in times like this, um, there are a lot of very good reasons why people need flexibility in those deadlines. And I think it's actually a good thing because it pushes instructors to think about what is it that we're really, uh, we really think is important for students to gain out of this course and to learn to go forward. So. If we think of a future where courses are designed so that they can be both resilient and equitable, I think that's where universities need to go, that you try to build in these high qualities and we'll talk about, I know other panelists will talk about them, um, such that if you are able to have in-person meetings, that's great, but if you don't, you can continue the learning and it can be done in a way that's equitable for the, all the students in the course. That's really the goal here. Thanks very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Dr. Means. I'm sure that we'll have time to you know, dive deeper in some of the areas that you highlighted. My next question is for Dr. Potter. Thank you again, Dr. Potter, for joining us. My question is about how, <clears throat> how has UDC been performing while facing COVID-19 challenge? What are the changes that the university has considered to ensure its student and community access to quality education and training uh, that they are depend on are provided? Thank you, Dr. Zendadil, and uh, for the opportunity to be here this morning. And um, it's, it's also my pleasure to see a number of colleagues across the US and locally participating in the webinar. Of course, the University of the District of Columbia, like most institutions, serve a number of students who come from households or backgrounds that represent the context and the makeup of those <clears throat> in the digital divide. And so when we talk about the digital divide and educational inequalities, we all know that this remains a significant and societal problem in the United States and elsewhere in which it impacts low income first generation and minority learners. So as a historically black urban land grant institution, as the university uh, began to learn more about COVID-19, there were a number of things that needed to be acted upon in quick measure. And fortunately, the University of the District of Columbia, through its Center for the Advancement of Learning, has had a, a history of training faculty to be builders and teachers in the online environment. And so that existed before I got here. And when I arrived here as the CAO, um, about 24% of the overall full-time faculty um, were online teaching certified, OTC certified. And so as a result of COVID, we were able to make the pivot to virtual learning uh, immediately after spring break. And of course, that sent a ripple effect through the institution because the question around quality of learning was always at the forefront of both students and faculty. And one of the things that I can say that the university has done very well with respect to those individuals 
who took advantage of the online teaching certifications is, is that they went through a fairly rigorous process to build those courses, but to build those courses according to the quality matter standards. And so it's embedded in those courses uh, that show up across the institution that have been certified. Our Office for Planning and Institutional Effectiveness, shortly after we had to make the pivot to uh, virtual and remote learning, sent out an institution-wide survey. And they surveyed all faculty and all students. We had about a 1,200 response rate uh, on that survey. And we learned a lot, both from faculty and students. And one of the things that I'd like to point out are some of the things that students indicated that were challenges for them that the institution needed to respond to. Our survey data provided results that, as uh, our good friend Barbara Means pointed out in her survey, that there were multiple users in the home where there was only one device uh, because the local schools had closed, Many of our faculty have children. Many of our students are in homes with siblings. And so there is one device and there is a family trying to be responsive to multiple things. The survey data also showed that many of our students who are part time and full time had job responsibilities as well. Many of our students are first frontline responders. They had child care. They had elder care. And I think the biggest uh, challenge that some of our students faced were uh, not only limited devices or no device at all, but connectivity. And so as a result, the university in the early parts of its closing kept the library open on the main campus. And what we did with the library was to provide the opportunity for students to be able to access devices and connectivity while practicing social distancing. As COVID became more prevalent in the district, we decided to take the library offline. However, we had implemented a laptop loaner program through our um, Office of Information Systems and Management. The Office of Academic Affairs was given about 80 laptops. And those laptops were really designed to create a laptop loaner program for faculty who were in the distance providing continuous instruction. And most of our faculty fortunately had their own devices and that they were able to continue their instruction through our learning management system. And as a result of having some devices left over, we were then able to turn to students and to provide those laptops that were remaining to students to take advantage of the continued learning, given the fact that our learning resources center, our library had closed with the prevailing of COVID-19. I would also say that the institution had to be very responsive through an ongoing understanding of thinking beyond COVID-19 for spring 2020 into summer and into our fall semester. And one of the things that became very clear in the survey data from students is that certain faculty were not equipped or trained to deliver their courses online. And one of the things that students wanted moving forward were certified faculty who could teach and deliver the courses if we were going to, in fact, be in a remote and in an online posture. And so the university continued through its Center for the Advancement of Learning, the online teaching certification process. And so between May, March 18th and May 15th, we trained an additional 77 faculty here at the institution, which brought that 24% up to 48%. So 48% of our full-time equivalent faculty at the university are now OTC certified. And I am very proud to say that we made the decision 
that if anyone was going to be offering courses in summer one and summer two, they had to be, they were required to be OTC certified because on the other end of that are students who are paying tuition, who deserve the very best instruction and the very best educational and learning experiences. In speaking with the staffing in our center on yesterday, I understand that for our next iteration of our Blackboard Primer and our online teaching certification, we have about 257 faculty. That will also include adjuncts who are registered for online teaching certification. And so the reality for us as an institution is, is that we are taking this very seriously because we understand the nature of the students that we serve, but we also understand that faculty professional development is an ongoing responsibility. And when you're thinking about students, particularly lower income students who are coming to a university less prepared uh, with respect to technology, who have job responsibilities, child care, elder care, connectivity, or one device in the home, faculty absolutely have to be in a position to provide synchronous and asynchronous learning opportunities. Faculty absolutely have to be in the position to provide the online advising, the online office hours, and all of these things have been a part of kind of how we have shifted and moved the institution into a virtual posture. And so we are hoping that through this process, our students are reaping the benefits from a trained faculty core and staff core because faculty don't do this alone. We have colleagues in student development and student success who are really advising and mentoring and helping students register for their courses. But we're hoping that all of the training that we are providing and all of the uh, the energy that the institution is investing and the resources that the institution is investing will pay off for a, a better experience on the other side, because we fully understand that with this digital divide and with it being an issue of social justice, that the university has to do more. The last thing that I will say as, um, as I respond to your question here is, is that the University of the District of Columbia is currently in conversations right now with Microsoft. And we're in conversations with Microsoft to begin to develop a partnership to provide computers and the appropriate software for incoming and transfer students. And clearly we know that many, many, many more students will need devices and software, but we've got to start somewhere. And so it is going to be a focus on our incoming and our transfer students. And then we are probably going to take uh, a portion of those units and distribute to continuing students who have challenges connecting or who don't have devices. And so the university is really thinking forward with respect to that issue. And we are continuing our online development of our faculty and staff to be responsive in the times of COVID in these uncertain times. Great, thank you, Dr. Potter. It's, it's good to hear that University UBC has a lot of plan in place to make sure that we can provide our quality education to our students. So, so we have uh, we are very happy that we have Mr. Henry here with us, the UBC student. And it's good to know, you know, it's important to understand that and you know, see that how they feel that you know their learning process impacted by COVID-19 and moving to an online environment. Mr. Henry, I would like to ask you, how do you, how do UDC students feel about online learning? How does that impact student progress toward their su success and future goals? Good morning, everyone. I would like to start by thanking you, Mr. Zendahel, for um, inviting me to the panel. As a student's perspective on issues like these um, really make make for a more fruitful discussion. So um, I'll start off by saying that UDC students are very comfortable with um, 
online learning. Um, the recent survey done, the recent COVID survey done by the university showed, however, that 2% of UDC students were not, um, did not have access to a computer um, during the pandemic. Now, I'm sure that these students are not as comfortable with online learning as um, other students who have access to um, devices. Now, seeing that the pandemic basically fell upon us, I think that the university did an extremely wonderful job um, connecting students to the internet and giving them devices that they can use to, to pursue their studies. Um, Dr. Potter spoke um, about the centralization of computers that students can access, um, and that was a very good move by the university. Now, in terms of hindering pro the progress of students, I think that the online learning has presented a lot of hindrances. For example, students have GPS to maintain, and a lot of students, a lot of UDC students actually learn better face-to-face. -face. Now, this is altogether wiped out by the COVID pandemic. We have to look at this going forward. Also, the mental health of students has to be put into the conversation, because there's one thing um, when you're home and you're learning online, but there's another thing when the only place you ha you're seeing is the four walls of your home. So it really has a big impact on the progress of students. And I think moving forward that the university is putting things in place to make students more comfortable, even more comfortable um, with online learning. I think that another issue um, that was presented to students was that they didn't really have access to faculty as often as they would. So, for example, a professor is going through the same pandemic as a student. So we have to keep into consideration that um, the faculty member is going through the same stress that a student is going through and have this person has to look at things around them and um, go through the pandemic just um, the same way a student is. So access to faculty, access to a professor, access to one-on-one -on -one time with a professor is um, hindered by the pandemic. So I think that online learning is fine with UDC students. UDC, UDC students are comfortable with online learning. However, we need to bridge the digital divide that is presented to us so that every student on, on the campus can have access to the internet and have access to computers so they can be successful in their learning. Also, I want to add that any student who made it through the pandemic online is a champion because there were a lot of things happening in the pandemic. Any student that um, made it through, any student that succeeded, any student that um, fought during the pandemic to keep their grades up and do all the work necessary to be a successful student is really a champion student. Okay, thank you, Mr. Henry. It's, it's good to, you know, to hear all those positive things and progress that students learn and adapt themselves to online learning. And thank you also for highlighting some of the challenges they are facing. Okay, so my next question is for Dr. Means. So during the earlier presentation, it was mentioned that the digital divide issue is not just a technological problem or issue, it's also a social issue. I would like to ask you to discuss a little bit and dive deeper a little bit on the social issue related to the digital divide. Sure, uh, thank you. Um, so part of what we have here is a sense of um, uh, stereotypes in our society around who does technology and who does not do technology. Uh, so particularly in some of the STEM fields, there is a sense that um, they are the, the domain of uh, people with certain kinds of, uh, you know, racial, ethnic, and economic backgrounds and uh, gender as well. And oftentimes you have a sense if you are not part of that particular group, if you're not a white or Asian male, um, that you don't necessarily belong in the field. You might not have the quote unquote right stuff. 
And I think uh, we're starting to see a lot of where we know that isn't true. Um, but it is really important that we question some of these cultural assumptions and that we design learning environments that are welcoming, that are not, uh, that are welcoming to all people and that are not sending messages about some people can do this and some people can't. Um, one of the big things we see is that the groups that are traditionally underrepresented in some of these STEM fields, um, that, that is, uh, you know, black students, Latinx students, females, um, they are much more motivated in many cases by social concerns, uh, by something that helps other people than they are if the same science concepts are presented out of any kind of context of helping the world be a better place. So one of the things we know that course designers and instructors can do is to really make the material relevant and socially responsible in ways that involve a much um, broader uh, you know, broader array of students in the content area and allows them to bring the things they know, um, the real world knowledge they have and their passion for helping other people to the content of these STEM and technology courses. So that's something I think is very important and that uh, institutions like the University of the District of Columbia, um, the University of, of Maryland, Baltimore County, um, in some cases have really been leaders in developing programs that, um, that help broaden participation in these traditionally uh, white Asian male fields. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I would like to move to Dr. Potter again here. So Dr. Potter, I know that one of the initiatives that you, you know, you spoke about, you know, previously was the UDC pathway to possible initiative. So how do you think that this initiative really can help us and help the UDC student and faculty to move beyond COVID-19 pandemic and you know, move us through this, this, this on a problem and then help us to you know, provide the education and, and, and training that we are providing for our student and community? So Dr. Zendadel, thank you for your, your question. And I, I think there is some context uh, <clears throat> that helps to kind of situate the University of the District of Columbia with respect to kind of workforce development, training, degree production, the All-American Talent Management System. As we all know, there are 101 accredited historically Black colleges and universities at, in the United States educating about 300,000 students at tuitions averaging just about 30% less than those charged at comparable institutions. Approximately 80% of our students um, are African American across HBCUs. Um, and from that, we produce about 17% of the bachelor's degrees earned by African Americans, 24% of the degrees earned by African Americans in science, technology, engineering, and math. And we are the top producers of African Americans who go on to get the PhD. Um, and, and that's the collective of HBCUs. HBCUs have never abandoned their mission of providing educational opportunities to students who may be otherwise marginalized. However, we are currently facing a number of challenges, including the declining enrollments, um, that most institutions are, are going to see with COVID-19. And so as a result of that, one of the things that I feel very positive about in terms of UDC is that we never forget the mission, right? And as part of our mission, we have um, an incredible resilience to help students understand that they are an important role to the future. And so as part of being an important role to the future, our equity imperative is really about preparing and creating pathways to the middle class. And so our pathways to possible is really about creating the opportunities, 
opening doors and windows around which students can enter through. The reality is, is that with COVID-19 and with the unemployment rates being what they are, there will be many citizens in the district and the DMV region looking for work. And because the University of the District of Columbia is a very unique institution, pathways to possible will allow anyone interested in earning a credential to enter into the university, whether that's through our workforce development program to earn an industry certification, whether that's through our two-year degree programs at the AAS level, the AA level, or the AS level at our branch campus, which is known as the community college, or whether that is through our four-year degree programs on our Van Ness campus. Um, more importantly, I think that Pathways to Possible uh, speak to our commitment to being an economic mobility engine in really restarting our community through economic development opportunities. And so when you consider Pathways to Possible, when you consider technology, when you consider healthcare, when you consider teacher education, teacher preparation, the University of the District of Columbia is really responding to the immediate needs of our region by providing an illustrious education at an affordable cost for individuals to be uh, successful. And that's what it's all about. And so Pathways to Possible really speaks to the opportunity of continuing to educate people at multiple levels and to help us to really be a partner in the district when it's really thinking about how do we mobilize and regenerate our economic development opportunities. Okay, that is good. That is very good news then. We are very happy to know about that. So let me open up to some of the you know, questions, the general questions that we have here. So we, we know that digital divide is not something new. And as all, you, know, you talk about this, you know, Dr. Me, Dr. Potter is something that you were facing last for, for you know, a long, long time. So I would like to know that maybe I can start with Dr. Means and then go to Mr. Henry. Do you think that COVID-19 and pandemic an issue? So bridging this gap and closing this gap a little bit closer, or do you think there's widening up the digital divide problem? Maybe I can start with Dr. Means. Um, I don't think, uh, let's see. Can hear you. We can hear you. I don't think that uh, the uh, pandemic widened the problem. I think the pandemic made the problem that was there more visible. Um, I think we, in some ways, uh, papered over the problem um, by bringing people together on a campus where you could provide some connectivity and devices for people that didn't have them. Now that might, that might address that uh, tip of the iceberg part of the digital divide. It didn't address the fact that those, those individuals didn't necessarily come from schools where they had those empowering uses of technology as part of their education. They didn't necessarily come from homes where they had parents or siblings that could help them learn how to use technology in powerful ways. So those things were still there. Um, but we kind of papered over them and gave everybody enough to get along when courses were taught on campus. When people had to go back to their homes, then it was just apparent. Uh, we couldn't ignore the divide that was there and the inequalities in the homes yet alone the inequalities around the social aspects of the digital divide. So I think, it's, I think it's making us face a problem that was there, that in some cases people um, were assuming had mostly been solved or it was good enough. And, and now we know, no, it's not good enough. We have to do better in order to be ready for the next crisis, whatever it is. Okay, so thank you. So you believe that because this issue is really highlighted the problem of digital divide and not really bridging it and closing the gap. So maybe I can go to Mr. Henry. So do you think that this problem, this moving to online uh, courses and teaching and learning, you know, provided you as a student a new opportunity, new skills, uh, awareness of, oh, I can do this this way, 
something positive out of this. Maybe if you have, if you can share something with us. Right. So um, I think that this pandemic and being home so much has really um, encouraged students to seek out um, their actual passions and their actual um, talents. Also, I think that it has um, enhanced their skills and because I think that students have more time to actually look at what they can improve on in terms of skills. And I think that um, with the time that students have um, in abundance now, students have really taken it to see out um, skills, number one, and two, um, financial opportunities like jobs and so on. Because in a time like this, there's no, there's really no time to sit around and do nothing because there's always need for a skill and there's always need for a source of income. And I think that in an area like this in DC where a lot of our students are um, not necessarily the most financially fortunate, I think that students really paid attention to what's happening and the changing world and really took charge of their of their lives and the skills they have. And they have actually made forward steps to enhance the skills that they have. So I think that the pandemic has really encouraged students to um, embrace passions and skills. Okay, that is, that is good to hear. That is good to hear. My next question, maybe I can start with Dr. Potter. So during the last few weeks, as I was preparing about, you know, the, starting the webinar, and I started to learn more and more about this advice. And one term that I, a lot of time I hear, new normal. So it seems that the board is accepting that this is our new normal and we need to be, adjust, be adjusted and be flexible with what's going on now. So do you think that UDC is, is ready for this new normal, Dr. Potter? So I, I would say, Dr. Zendadale, that um, I believe the university is positioned and postured appropriately for what's to come, right? Um, I, I, I kind of steer away from these terms of normalcy because what's normal for one individual is not uh, the same for another. And I think that when we paint broad strokes about normality or normalcy, sometimes we have missed opportunities uh, because our narratives are very different. Uh, our lived experiences are very different. COVID has exposed uh, a lot of the injustices and the inequities um, and, you know, one of the things that I, I'd like to say about this is, is that the inequities and the injustices uh, have been predetermined or pre-existing conditions. And so we're now having to deal with those on multiple layers and multiple levels. But fortunately for the University of the District of Columbia, uh, because we have a responsiveness and because we are really, really trying to examine uh, where the future is. Uh, you heard Dr. Moore talking about the future is now, inventing the future. We are we're dealing with that. We're in the middle of it. And so I think the more we can train our faculty uh, to be competent and good stewards of online technology and online pedagogies, I think the more we can embrace our students and walking them through the ease of understanding the value of learning and the importance of what it means while at the same time allowing them to be authentic in this process. I think that the university will continue to soar uh, and I think that our students will continue to prosper. And I think ultimately the University of the District of Columbia will be the model that people will look to. Okay, great. Thank you. So, Dr. Means, maybe I can ask you more or less the same question in respect to the new normal. So how do you think the overall universities should respond or will respond to this new normal and operate, making sure that they can provide education and, the, and all the services that they used to provide to the communities and the students? I am hoping that universities are taking this opportunity uh, to really go down the path that University of District Columbia did with your online teaching certification. That is making sure that their faculty are equipped 
to teach online as well as in person and that can move back and forth between the different uh, modalities and that there's support services for students, uh, including supplemental instruction and tutoring and other kinds of student supports can be made available virtually as well as in person. So this is really part of continuity planning for universities. And I think that's where they really need to go, recognizing that their models need to be resilient across different disruptions that may happen. You know, there may be another wave of this pandemic or there may be new pandemics or other disasters. And so I think we're really starting to realize that uh, you need to be able to work in a virtual environment if necessary. It's not that people don't want to get together, don't want to meet face to face, they do, but sometimes that's not a choice. So it's no longer a question of whether online is as good as face to face. It's a question of you've got to be ready to do this virtually if necessary. Okay, that is good. So let me ask the same question from Mr. Henry. Are you ready for this new normal? Um, I will start by saying um, the drastic shift that happened when the pandemic fell upon us um, has been handled quite well by students. So I think that moving forward into the quote unquote new normal will be a very smooth process for students because we have, I think, went through the hardest of times in relation to having access to certain technologies and just simply moving very fast into um, online learning. No, I think that the new normal has to be constructed in such a way that every student has, has the opportunity to access um, technologies and the software that they need to um, pursue their courses. Because in a lot of STEM, cor in a lot of STEM courses, um, a lot of technology is required um, and a lot of software is required to actually get into the practical aspects of um, learning. So I think that if modified properly and the new normal is conditioned in such a way that students are actually super comfortable with um, learning online, I think that um, all students will be in a very good position. I really appreciate your, your message that it should be inclusive. I really believe that. I'm reading some of the questions that I ha we have here from our follower and audience here. The one question is that does, does online learning discriminate against students with disabilities? Maybe can I ask Dr. Potter to answer this question? Um, I would say that I'm not sure that online learning or virtual or remote learning discriminates in an intentional manner. Um, I think one of the things that technology has done is to enable all kinds of learners, neurodivergent learners, the access that they need. So within our Blackboard learning management system, um, there are features uh, that really empower and enable students with learning disabilities or students who are neurodivergent learners, uh, the access that they need uh, to be successful in that modality, right? And so I think learning management systems are well equipped to meet the needs of individuals who may have learning disabilities. And I think that it is incumbent upon institutions to leverage those forms of technologies within their learning management systems to make sure that there is equity and parity across um, the offerings. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Means, do you wanna share anything here? Well, I would just uh, underscore what Dr. Potter said. And I think uh, we talked earlier about the universal design for learning and really thinking about that up front. That is, there need to be multiple ways for individuals uh, with different strengths and uh, lacks of strength to be able to access information and also to be able to demonstrate what they know. And again, we need to make sure that those are available to everyone in the virtual environment as well as when people are in class. Okay, thank you. So my, I, I'm reading again next question from our audience. I, I think I believe that this question which should be something that uh, Mr. Henry would like. Uh, can digital learning moving forward lessen dependency or expensive textbooks? So 
I don't know, Dr. Means, you want to start with this? Um, yes, and I think that is absolutely true. Um, Digital Promise is part of something called the Every Learner Everywhere Network. Um, that is 12 organizations that is currently working with colleges and universities to promote the improvement of lower division high enrollment undergraduate courses through incorporating uh, digital technology. That can be open educational resources uh, that are without cost, or they can be low cost products that are um, are designed such that you do not need a print, print textbook when you use these resources. And one of the things we saw in this uh, current crisis is that the um, courses that had been involved in doing this, that had been thoughtfully uh, redesigned and implemented because they had a certain uh, cadence, a rhythm, a pattern they had set up, set up for students about how they do different kinds of activities, different days of the week for each module. Um, those students already had developed more agency or control over their own learning. And then when they went to this switch to virtual learning, it was actually much easier for them because they were used to having that agency and that kind of um, self-regulation of their learning that is required when you go online. Um, so as uh, Mr. Harry said, uh, it made the transition much easier. Okay, great. So let me ask Mr. Harry, do you see a cost of you know, buying textbook as a barrier to our student learning? And do you think that moving to the digital you know, classes and you know, using digital resources, that is something positive? How do you think about that? Right, so um, as we all know, one of the major concerns as it relates to um, the cost of tertiary education is um, the cost of textbooks. No, I think the the shift to online learning really lessened the concern that students have for um, textbooks and acquiring textbooks. Now, a lot of information we already know is um, online. Now, if we move into the quote unquote new normal, having this set of information from these textbooks online, I think that we will benefit tremendously um given that students won't have to purchase these books also i want to mention that with technology we're moving from having to study and memorize um facts from a textbook and we're moving into more practical um forms of learning so i think that the shift has really has had some impact on um the need for textbooks okay Thank you, thank you very much. So Dr. Potter, my next question, again, I'm, pull, I'm, I'm pulling it out from the, the, the question that our audience you know, shared. So where do you see the role of UDC and the skilled technical workforce in relation to the digital divide? So I, I, I think I know where that question originates from. And uh, I think that UDC particularly when we're talking about the skilled technical workforce. And if you've looked at the report from the National Science Board, um, UDC is well positioned to be um, uh, a location or an institution of higher learning to offer the necessary industry certifications uh, that are gonna meet the needs of closing the gaps within a skilled technical workforce. I think people are going to be very selective in the kinds of education that they want. Uh, I think that individuals are going to be really counting their nickels and their dimes uh, and looking at where they make investments. And so because we have a workforce development program and because we have associates degrees that are offered through our institution, I think that uni the University of the District of Columbia is primed. Um, clearly, the demands that are going to come out of COVID are going to be healthcare. Our nursing programs, our radiology programs, our uh, medical billing programs, our mortuary science programs. If you think about our cloud programs and cloud certifications, um, we are very well positioned to be able to respond to the healthcare demands to uh, careers in IT and STEM, 
But more importantly, I would say that the institution is also positioned very well to help rethink uh, what education is going to be, right? Uh, we're sitting here and we're talking about virtual learning, online learning. One of the greatest catastrophes that will come out of this will be the ruminating around how public school systems may not have been necessarily prepared to deal with the fallout of COVID. And so as a public university, and as we think about the skilled technical workforce, I think that the University of the District of Columbia can be a leader in helping to rethink this notion of public education and what is needed. But ultimately, for those individuals who will be making career choices or thinking about the next credential, we are here in position to close that gap because we offer industry certifications and associates degrees. And I think that people are gonna be very mindful of that. Okay, thank you, Dr. Potter. So Mr. Henry, I want to share one of the questions from the, in our audience that start from you. Can digital learning benefit a student to be a self learner? So how do you feel about that? Then I want to move to Dr. Ming. I think that students have really had the time to sit and think about the type of learner they are. Um, in a time like this, in the pandemic, you have to actually reshape your schedule. You have to see what can be done, what cannot be done, what can you do during the pandemic, what you can't do. Now, um, the pandemic has presented students with the opportunity to learn on their own time. Now, this has benefited students tremendously. And I think that self-learning um, should self-learning is to be integrated into um, the regular flow of learning in an institution. And um, seeing that a pandemic has fallen upon us, um, students have to depend on this more than what uh, a lecturer is saying on um, WebEx, for example, or another um, platform. No. Self-learning is the leader in um, education for students now, given the pandemic, because students have to depend on their own wills and their own ways of learning certain things given the pandemic, because it, it has presented unique situations to us where students have to figure out for themselves, um, how do we overcome, how do I overcome this situation? So students really have had to sit back and look at the type of learner they are, and really um, take notes on how to progress in their education. Okay, thank you. So how do you think about this, Dr. Mee? Well, I think Mr. Henry has uh, really nailed it that it's, it's important for students to become that kind of independent learner who's reflecting on their own progress, but uh, the faculty can help them do that. Uh, even before a course is, uh, fully virtual if, in fact, you are incorporating uh, kinds of activities and digital learning products that require students to be interacting with the material that they're actually, um, you know, answering questions and practicing, but in ways that ask them to reflect on, do you understand this? Um, what's the part about this that you're still confused about? Um, what do you feel you've mastered? And so we can actually encourage students to do that. And there's another piece of it, which is that in some of these digital learning systems, that information that's called from students can then be available to the faculty member. So you can see in a certain module of study, these were the three things that students are really struggling with that many of them have been trying, you know, they've been working at it, but they're having trouble applying this concept. So in my next person to person meeting, or it could be a synchronous meeting online, I'm gonna talk about those particular concepts and we're gonna practice doing this as a group where they can interact with me um, while they're doing it. But having set up that independent learning experience for students and the notion that you are in charge of your own learning really prepares students for doing this going forward and if their class goes entirely um, goes entirely virtual. So I, I think that really should be a major thrust of the preparation, the professional development for faculty and of what faculty try to do in redesigning their courses to be resilient in the face of threats like this pandemic. 
Okay, it's very, very interesting. I want to, you know, come back to that, you know, what you explained here, Dr. Mead. But first, I want to share another question with Dr. Potter. So one of, most probably one of our students said, Dr. Potter, that some universities are planning to test their student COVID-19. What about UDC? Could you repeat that question, Dr. Zendadel? I couldn't hear you. Some universities are planning to test their student COVID-19. What about UDC? I still couldn't hear you. So some universities are planning to test their student COVID-19. What about UDC? I'm having trouble hearing. I'm not muted. The doctor means, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes, but I don't know the answer. <laughs> yeah, I <should> <laughs> um, you know, let me let me share it. So, Doctor Doctor Potter, can you read through the chat? So I'm just sharing you through the chat. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going through the chats now. Okay. I just I just. So can you hear me now? I can hear you now. Okay. Some universities, this is one of the one question from most probably one of our students. Some universities are planning to test their student COVID-19. What about UDC? So I don't I, I don't think that we've arrived at 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 an answer. Um, I think you know when the institution uh, considers all of the variables, if I heard the question correctly. When the institution is considering all of the variables, um, we will make the most informed decisions uh, about uh, what the next steps are. Okay, great. So my next question is for you, Dr. Means. So, and then maybe I can also engage in Mr. Henry. One of the questions is about the, the setting. So Dr. Potter, you explained that your UDC shares some, uh, provided some laptops or computer to a student for those who really need or do not have a laptop. So maybe Dr. Means you can help me. The question is about the computer desktop versus laptop. So does this, does the, the difference, does, is there any difference by providing a laptop or the you know, desktop regarding the outcome and learning outcome for a student? I don't think we have any evidence that there is a difference in the learning outcomes for students between desktops and laptops. I will say, though, that, um, uh, you know, not all laptops <laughs> are created equal. Not all desktops are created equal. Um, so there, you know, there is an issue about the, uh, the age and the power of the particular computing device. Um, also, sometimes um, you, you think about it. Uh, most cases, um, desktops tend to be used in, say, fairly quiet settings like a computer lab or it would be a home that maybe had a study corner in a certain place for it. Whereas laptops are used in all kinds of places, um, you know, certainly the coffee shop. Um, and responding to our survey, a number of students said, um, you know, I'm, it's hard to do my coursework from my bed. It's like, okay. <laughs> They're probably using a laptop, not a desktop in bed, we can assume. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily blame the laptop. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Potter, uh, I have a question here that I think should be for you. Does our staff, UDC staff, have the resources and training to move our program online in an effective way in UDC? So I, I would say that, you know, as we have done for our faculty, particularly with online teaching certifications and whatnot, uh, the university can do a better job at providing professional development opportunities for staff, right, uh, and resources. And so I mentioned earlier the laptop loaner program, and just as faculty and students were to place, displaced, professional staff who help units run like staff assistants, administrative personnel, um, did not have computers where they could access a uh, banner or uh, certain types of technologies to help them along the way in doing their job. 
And so there were at least on 15 to 20 occasions where we provided laptops and or a desktop for professional staff so that they could in fact access banner and continue their work at home. Having said that, equipment is one thing, but I think that as we continue to think through the future of the university, uh, we've got to have a greater conversation around the professional development needs of our staff. Uh, and of course, the university being the quasi-independent agency of the District of Columbia, there are a range of professional development opportunities that are offered through DCHR but we've got to be a lot more intentional in terms of how we talk to staff and how we help them plan through the development opportunities um, that are available and those that we will be able to offer here on our campus as well. Okay, thank you very much. You know, to respect everybody's time, now is 11.25. I think we are getting close to the end of our webinar. And I have maybe one more question that I want to then give every of our panelists for their closing remark. So, Mr. Henry, you are uh, representing, you know, Caribbean Student Association. Was digital device something that you ever discussed with your friends in that association? Well, the digital divide had not been discussed, um, but as um, Ms. Means said, um, the digital divide was always there. The pandemic just simply um, showed us that it's actually there. So I think we, I think students took for granted the fact that they actually have certain things, and students who did not have access to certain equipment um, were always facing the problem of the digital divide. So I think conversations like like these will really help um, get every student to really understand the um, impact that the digital divide has on learning um, on students as a whole. Okay, good. But how do you think about the gender digital divide? Do you, do you think that even that when you go to the gender digital divide, the gap is wider? You're talking about, you know, you know boys of our girls, or, you know, men of our women here, among a student here? I could, I could not say for sure. But I'm sure that there's some inequity um, as it relates to gender and the digital divide. Okay, great. Maybe I can I can close with that question, Dr. Means, about gender digital divide. So, what is gender digital divide, Dr. Means? Is it something that we really need to worry about? Um, I think you certainly need to worry about it in uh, STEM fields. Um, uh, so, what we see is that uh, males and females use technology differently from a fairly early age. Um, there is a higher proportion of males who are uh, intensive gamers and who are also um, doing, say, programming to, um, add, to enhance and add to their uh, games. Uh, females are more interested in applications that have a social aspect to them, social media, they're more, at, uh, they're more active on social media. So it's not that one is interested in technology and the other isn't, but what often happens then is in their uh, schooling, as you transition to things that are called technology or computing courses or coding, um, is that, uh, uh, girls and also students from lower income homes that maybe didn't have a lot of technology in the home, they go into a class, they're surrounded by what tend to be males from more affluent homes who have spent six years coding and playing these games intensively. They, they speak in a code, I mean, not coding, but they speak in a certain language that can make other people feel excluded. And so I think it's really important for educators to design learning opportunities that are more inclusive. And in some cases, we seem to have an indication that it's helpful to design learning opportunities, particularly just, just for girls for a while or just for um, African-American young men um, and for them to kind of have the opportunity to um, apply the same skills to things they care about and then be ready 
to compete with those kids who have been doing the gaming for eight years. Okay, great. So, Dr. Potter, do you want to share quickly something about the topic? This topic? I, I, I would just say that uh, it, it it is clear to me that there is um, a difference in terms of orientation and, and, and how computers or technology is introduced to little boys and little girls, just even thinking about my own nieces and nephews uh, and the orientation to technology that my nephews leap to in terms of gaming and the like. But I would say even more broadly, when we think about the gender digital divide, uh, that socioeconomic disadvantages that women face uh, contribute to that problem, particularly uh, if they are reliant upon one income. Uh, but it could also be the reverse. It could be that the woman is the breadwinner uh, in a household uh, and that there is a lag on the male side as well. And so I think that as we continue to have more conversations about the lack of equality or the lack of access to technology, uh, we have to do it in such a way uh, that is meaningful uh, to fully understand the range and the depth of what the gender divide and how it's caused. Okay, thank you very much. So we have a, a number of questions that we could not have enough time to answer, but this is for the audience. We, as you know that we are recording the event and I will promise that I will share the question with our panelists and make sure that we post the answers. If you share any comments, for sure we will post in your UDC website. So in this way you can access to the answers and also public can see your comments or any information that you provided. So with this, I would like to ask each panelist, you know, for two minutes to provide us with your closing remarks. Maybe I can start with Dr. Park. So I would just say, Dr. Zendendale, thank you. I think that this is a timely conversation uh, and very much needed, not just here at the University of the District of Columbia, but across higher ed uh, in general. Now, I would say that the digital divide is a serious concern for, for higher education, especially as schools seek to increasingly reach out to underserved populations. As part of the commitment to assurance of learning, institutions like UDC will need to invest in a thorough examination of the information and technology literacy skills needed uh, for our students. And we need to really spend some more time understanding the perceptions of students, both coming into our institution as well as following uh, various kinds of courses that build in digital literacy. These types of activities are necessary for continuous improvement and one that will help us move from a digital divide to digital equity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maybe I can move to Dr. Mee. I would just like to underscore what Dr. Potter said. Um, someone once said a, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. And I actually think that uh, HBCUs like the University of District of Columbia have a real opportunity uh, to face this crisis and the inequity head on and become leaders in the incorporation of really good instruction supported by digital learning going forward and to help other institutions, all kinds of institutions do that better. HBCUs already know a lot about inclusive instruction. They already serve African-American students with a, in a high proportion, as was mentioned earlier, of students going on into STEM fields. They know a lot about culturally responsive instruction. They're learning a lot and are acquiring expertise in how to do digital learning well. If you can bring those two things together, I think you can be a beacon for the nation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Henry. Right. So I think that closing the digital divide um, is enriched by um, discussions like this one. Now, we need to realize that um, every facet of um, tertiary learning is um, incorporated in some way with technology um, to even get into a higher get into higher ed education um, you need um, access to technology right so like applying to a, a university applying to a college you need access to technology to even do so 
even if you do a paper application, you need to fill in the slot that says um, email address, and then you need um, technology to access that email address. So going into tertiary education itself is um, shows the digital divide. Now, um, students who, I want to finish by saying students who um, made it through the pandemic um, are really to be congratulated um, because this was very sudden. And um, seeing how students maneuvered through um, what was happening, I really want to congratulate each and every student that made it through um, the pandemic um, and on online learning. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. So with this, I would like to thank uh, all of our panelists, Dr. Potter, Dr. Means, and Mr. Henry to join us today and share their ideas, their thoughts, their insights. As you said, Dr. Potter is really, that is the time to, to discuss about this topic as we are facing COVID-19. I also want to talk our UBC team and our follower who followed us through, through this webinar. I hope that you found the webinar informative and helpful. We are looking forward to speaking with you during our next webinar. With this, I appreciate everybody and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.